And uh, let's start my talk, which is about the role of open source software in the video game industry and uh, gaming communities. So for introduction, I am uh, Daniel Horuk Molnar, just call me Horuk. And uh, I'm a member of the Hackerspace Budapest. And uh, I, I did a LAN party series called Lakatlan, which is a Hungarian word, uh, word play, meaning uh, padlock LAN. Um, it also has a meaning uh, that implies that the first hackerspace was located in a ruin pub because it also means uninhabited. Those are the flyers for the first LAN party we had. And I also worked on a game as a community manager that's called Heavy Gear Assault. Uh, for disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, and uh, all copyrights belong to their respective owners. So what's the scope of this talk? This is by no means a complete list of open source games, engines, tools, and such. And it's uh, not even exclusive about uh, GNU Linux gaming. It's meant to categorize video game related software and content based on the availability of the source code and uh, assets. And of course, to describe how this affects the industry and the community build around such games. And by the way, today is uh, Video Games Day which is an arbitrary holiday, but this is a good excuse to talk about video games here. <laughs> so what are video games? Not all of you are gamers, but uh, I'm pretty sure you already heard about them. The reason I ask this question is because it actually shows how games are made out of code and content, otherwise known as assets. This can be text, audio, 2D art, 3D art, and so on. So making games is actually a uh, multidisciplinary uh, art form because it requires 2D, 3D artists, musicians, sound designers, game designers, level designers, all sorts of designers, backend engineers, and so on. More often than not, coders don't have the artistic flair to make such games at, uh, well, let's just say, pretty or uh, aesthetic. So this is what we call program art in both uh, video games and, and the demo scene. This is, uh, this in this episode, yeah, applies to the demo scene, I just said that. <laughs> and of course, uh, there can be many uh, talented and hardworking women army in the groups out there, and in the companies out there. But usually, even small teams are composed of people with different backgrounds. We'll talk about this later. Okay, this differentiation of, oh, sorry, go back. One more thing. Uh, the important part I wanted to talk about here is that this differentiation of code and content will be important later during the talk. So what is open source? I don't want to read this part. You are already probably familiar with it. Uh, I just want to add that open source doesn't just mean uh, access to the source code. Uh, the distribution terms of open source software must also comply with the following criteria. And something I will talk about here later is the third one, derived works. Also, here's another definition for free software by the Free Software Foundation. And the Freedom 1 and 3 require source code to be available because uh, studying and modifying software without source code is highly impractical. With that being said, during my talk, I will mention projects that uh, uh, does not qualify as either free software or open source. And uh, you will see why. Also, about free software, here's an interesting quote by Richard Stallman. He wrote this about SteamOS and the uh, new Linux versions of the Steam client itself, which is DRM. I'm gonna let, let you some time to read it. <clears throat> so, license legends. I'm gonna use these color-coded acronyms to indicate if something's license complies with either the OSI or FSF standards. And uh, the yellow thing there, shared source, is actually a Microsoft blurb. I will talk about it. And uh, since I will only talk about software that had its source code shared in a way or another, uh, PS means the license does not grant you freedom to make it your own, but the source code is somehow accessible. Same thing about content. OC means the license is recognized by OSI and FSF. There's another category there uh, for Creative Commons, even though the uh, latest uh, attribute share like 40, uh, 40 is accepted by FSF, 
but there are other licenses out there for content, which is not recognized by either of these groups. And there are other retired licenses like the Sampling Plus and so on. Uh, yeah, abandonware content, it's, it's, it's great, but it's actually not a legal term. Uh, this is a gray area itself, and uh, it's not used as much nowadays since publishers started uh, re-releasing their own games, and there are other companies porting these old games, so you can actually buy them on GOG or another website. And of course, PC means fuck you. So, uh, about the industry. Oh. Sorry. Let me fix this. Triple games have the highest development budgets and levels of promotion, and this also means that there is a high economic risk, risk involved with them. And this is why publishers will only pour money into projects that will make the money back and some more. And uh, don't forget that the Video games industry is now even bigger than Hollywood itself. So, <clears throat> yeah, this AAA is not really a specific acronym for anything, but it usually stands for a lot of time, a lot of resources, a lot of money. <clears throat> and uh, credits of a AAA game usually consists of hundreds of names of people because uh, they can afford celebrity voice actors. And, oh, yeah, I actually wanted to mention here that. Uh, Voice Actors Guild actually started a uh, strike recently, so. <laughs> and so on, so mocam stunt actors and, and stuff like that, so that's why uh, you see a long credits list like in a movie. And there's another story. Uh, indie is a short form for independent. There's no widely accepted uh, definition for indie, but it usually means that uh, they are published outside and produced outside of mainstream means and they often make these games without the financial aid of a publisher. And uh, because of this, they can focus on innovation. They can get away with stuff. And uh, they also heavily rely on digital distribution. And since this is uh, synonymous with PC gaming here nowadays, uh, if you're not on Steam, that means your game doesn't exist. But there are, of course, other digital distribution platforms out there for indies like Ichio, the Sur, and so on. And of course, big publishers can afford their own. But let's not talk about them anymore. <laughs> so these games are usually smaller in scope. They can still be narrative driven or have pure gameplay, gameplay focus, but they're usually free to experiment. And uh, experienced in the, we experienced recently in the Renaissance, know that the entry level has been lower, lowered with the digital distribution and out-of-the-box game engines and stuff like that. It's easier to make video games than ever. But uh, lately, people talk about actually an indie apocalypse, meaning that the market is oversaturated with shovelware. I don't know if you've seen the Steam charts. Uh, I think it was like 80% of games on Steam was released last year. So. Nice. Okay, let's talk about the community. And uh, what, uh, I, by community, I actually mean the <clears throat> fan base of uh, games and their subgroups working on modifications or mods for short, or of course, hobbyists, hobbyist game developers. So on the list, we have the modders. They usually work with an already existing game, even if it supports modding or not, they don't care. They make their own changes to those games. And of course, we have ROM hackers here who are exclusively uh, working with uh, uh, usually cartridges and games that was never designed to be written. And uh, I have to mention the homebrew community. <clears throat> they are targeting uh, proprietary hardware, just like uh, ROM hackers, but they are <coughs> making their own <clears throat> games from the ground up. And uh, similar is <coughs> uh, the, the fan game community. They are not modifying an existing game, but they are basically hobbyist developers. And I wanted to mention the Japanese doujin game scene here because they are a little bit unique, mostly because of the language barrier and also because they usually work with genres that are not really popular outside of Japan. 
All right, let's talk about engine system frameworks, and I'm starting with these big ones, even though, <clears throat> even though, as you can see, they are not open source at all. I wanted to do this because there is a misconception that these engines are somehow open source because you can access the source code for both of them. For example, the Amazon Lumber Yard, which is derived from the CryEngine, explicitly says in the license that we make the source code available to enable you to fully customize your game, but your rights are limited by the Lumberyard service terms. And of course, I won't quote that here. <laughs> and I wanted to talk about the Unreal Engine because it, that's a wide and really popular engine used by both AAA <coughs> companies and indies alike. <clears throat> and uh, there's, this is also an engine where you have access to the source code, but the, yeah, I actually wanted to mention Unreal Tournament 4 here, which is a project based on this engine, because uh, it has an interesting uh, development cycle. Content is uh, partially community created, and the uh, source code is, for the game itself is also available, but non-free. Uh, yeah, UT3, I don't know if you guys remember, it was a weak excuse for a video game. It was basically just a um, tech demo to showcase the engine, because Epic nowadays just sells engines. You know, not really working on video games anymore. And uh, they somehow wanted to involve the community in this new game they're working on. That basically means free, uh, free labor for them. So the game source code is available on GitHub, but you have to link your Epic and GitHub accounts to get access to it. And uh, they, teed, um, but they actually take feedback and the assets from the fans, so they implement those into games as well. It's a slow but steady and surprisingly open development process. This is why I wanted to mention it here. All right, now these ones are open source. As you can see, it has both the OS and FS flag next to it, meaning that the, li the license uh, complies with both the OSI and FSF standards. <clears throat> and I have to mention Blender here because it's a uh, most well-known bloatware with a game engine component. It has a video editor, a, a 3D modeler, can be used for rigging, particle simulation, does everything. And uh, notable games, uh, game using this engine would be Sintel, which is uh, based on the movie with the same title that was made by the Blender Foundation. Also, another thing I wanna talk about it here is Mono Game Framework, the second one, because it's uh, Microsoft, uh, it's made by Microsoft. It's actually licensed under Microsoft Public License, which is approved by both uh, OSI and FSF. It's an open source implementation of the Microsoft XNA4 framework. And many, many notable indie titles use it, such as Ex Exxon Verge, Bastion, Fast, Transistor, Stardew Valley. <clears throat> so it's out there. And uh, I also selected some other engines and wrote down some games that are using it, but I don't wanna go and read all of it because it's, uh, quite, it's quite a long list. But uh, I might want to talk about, for example, Godot, which is also a open source but community developed 2D and 3D cross platform engine. And there are some other engines that, that uh, and those were made specifically for a game at first, but now they are used for other stuff as well. For example, the Spring Engine, that's an engine for RTS game, games and uh, originally was meant as a spiritual successor for Total Annihilation. And uh, another RTS engine is Pyrogenesis on this list. And I, I actually wrote some other funnier ones like Stepmania, which is a cross-platform rhythm video game engine. And of course, there are some FPS engines here <coughs> designed uh, as open source from scratch, <laughs> like Cube2. <coughs> All right, uh, let's talk about APIs and libraries. And let me start with uh, OpenGL and its follow-on Vulkan, because if you ever played a 3D game in the 90s, uh, there's a good chance that you played with something that had OpenGL running underneath the hood, and because it was the standard back then. But uh, even nowadays, if you're playing on a non-Microsoft platform, like a something that's not an Xbox or a Microsoft Windows machine, there's a good chance that it's also running OpenGL because the alternative is usually the Microsoft's uh, DirectX. And uh, yeah, its successor is Vulkan and some games are already using it. 
For example, the first game to use it was the Talos principle, but some AAA titles used it since like uh, Doom that was released last year. Oh, I hate when they don't put a number in the title and you have to use the year because they are making the reboot. And yeah, I also mentioned the SDL here, which is in an engine. Oh, no, I'm not talking about engines anymore, which is, uh, let me get my notes. Another one in the meantime I mentioned is RackNet, which is for networking, because <coughs> coding networks is really hard, so you don't want to reinvent the wheel here. And it's surprising because its license is actually approved by the uh, Free Software Foundation, but not by the Open Source Initiative. Talking about SDL, it's a simple direct media layer. It's cross-platform, and um, a bunch of games use it, like Open TDD, Xenotic, which is an FPS, Open Red Alert, which I will talk about later. Even some commercial titles, a bunch of them, like FTL, Dying Light, and so on, even AAA ones. And of course, the engines are using SDL as well, like the Cry engine, the Source engine, the, the Linux port and Mac port, not the Windows one. And even emulators like DOSBox and Xenas. So about tools and uh, open formats. Some of these tools are made specifically for game development, uh, usually by the indie scene, and they evolve their community as well in development. Such example is the Twine there, which, is, which was made for branching narrative design. And uh, it's for called Yarn Spinner, which was specifically made for the game on the screenshot called uh, uh, Night in the Woods. And uh, I will reference talk later about this game, GDC talk, where, where the coder of this tool talked about how indies should release their tools as open source and involve their communities because it helps them out a lot. So other well-known software on this list involve GIMP, which is frequently used by hobby developers. But uh, of course, AAA companies usually either make their own tools in-house or pay for a proprietary product. They also mentioned some formats here like Hogwarts. OK, content resources. There are many sites out there that have some kind of free content for a video game, wallpaper, sprites, and such, but they are usually, they usually license under something that uh, you can later sell in a commercial product. This is why I want to mention uh, opengameart.org here, because this is a quite interesting sign, and the only one I found so far that actually pays attention to only publish arts and other assets under GPL, public domain, or CC licenses that are approved by Free Software Foundation and the Open, open Source Initiative. <clears throat> All right, and this is the longest part of the talk, the <laughs> source code and content and different categories of it divided into two. The first one is about open source games and the second one is about commercial titles with the source code available, asterisk attached. So the first one is open sourcing, which means that the game or the engine or the software was previously proprietary software, but it was made open source. The best example for this is the, they are the IDEC engines made by its software, previously known as Doom and Quake engines. They were retconned to IDEC and got a number assigned to them later. So John Carmack usually released these older generations after he worked on a new generation of the engine used for the games. And if a game is popular enough, usually that means that source ports will emerge. This is why uh, you can run basic Doom basically on every mach machine on Earth. And this is why we have so many open source FPS games out there, because most of them are based on the Doom or Qu usually the Quake engines. I actually had a talk about the Quake engine during uh, Lakotlan, and I, I want to share those slides later. I don't want to talk about them now. And uh, yeah, these open source games are made open source, usually from ground up like Hedgehogs or T-Birds. So these are usually made by the GNU Linux community. Uh, Hedgehogs is a Worms clone, it's, um, and T-Birds is a 2D side-scrolling action game. 
It's sort of like real-time worms. Yeah, sort sort of. Yeah, it has the yeah similar weapons and such like ninja rope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, patch wars. That's uh, oh. And you can also I think it even it. comes with a bunch of Linux distros by default. So uh, yeah, as I said, these can be clones of uh, well-known games or more or less original, like Hedge Wars. Yeah, T Wars too. Well, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, T Wars. I want to, yeah, I want to say T Wars. Yeah, Hedge Wars is a shameless ripoff, but it's still a really fun game. <laughs> and one can build such a game on a source port of um, open source uh, engine I was talking about. And examples for that is Free Doom and Open Arena. And those are actually basically just Doom and Quake 3 Arena, but since those games share their source code as open source, but not their art assets, that means that you can comply your own version, whatever, but you have to replace the uh, assets inside them, or you have to own a legitimate copy of the original game. And this is why their project like Free Doom, basically, which uh, provides you a, a, a what file. And the modern source ports of Doom, like, uh, GZ Doom and other source ports can read that file, and you have a um, Doom replacement. The same for uh, Open Arena. Uh, these kind of games are, yeah, all of them were made open source, but they differ a little bit. Uh, the content is not not free usually here. The uh, only reason OpenTD is all green here because I used green as well for CC, but it's using a license that's not compatible with, it's not approved by FSF and OSI. So Frets on Fire is a, it's a music game, it's a Guitar Hero clone. There's even a picture there uh, where we are playing that very game uh, at uh, Lokotlan in Hackerspace Budapest. And uh, the reason it has uh, proprietary content because it's using uh, proprietary music in it. But the source code is, is, is open source. Uh, another example here is the Urban Terror, which is an FPS game. It's somewhat similar to Counter-Strike. And it was originally developed as a Quake 3 mod. But since the Quake 3 engine is open source, it can be a standalone game now. The interesting part is that it's based on an open source engine, but the game code and the art assets are still uh, uh, on the, the proprietary license. So they distribute the game code itself as binaries and you're not allowed to touch them. And uh, the other picture here is Plane Shift, which is an MMORPG. I was looking for open source MMORPG and actually I only found just a couple of them. I'm, and I'm not this surprised because open MMORPG is a huge project, but this one is actually, this one was built as a GPL open source project from the ground up, but they have a dual licensing because they have another license for their content as well. And uh, these are open source remakes with non-free content. They're usually remakes of uh, well-known other commercial titles. Uh, for example, OpenXCOM is a new engine that can run the original XCOM game. But of course, if you don't, have, don't own a copy of XCOM, it has some placeholder assets, so you can still play with it, but it expects you to own a copy of XCOM and copy the files into its folder, and from that point on, it can be used as a modern uh, source port of XCOM with new added features. So these projects usually aim to basically give a new uh, coat of paint to older games, like uh, implement new functionalities. For example, uh, Open Red Alert, the picture to the right, is that's actually a quite interesting of a project because Open Red Alert, as it is, is just uh, engine, the RTS engine, it doesn't uh, have any games in it by default, but since the first three uh, uh, Westwood titles were made uh, freeware, that means that they can't um, distribute those games, of course, because they don't own the rights, but the game can download from, from Electronic Arts website, and uh, you can play Common Day Conquer 1, Red Alert 1, and Doom 2000 in this game with, with the proprietary uh, art assets in them, and it's running an open source engine and it has a lot of cool new features from later Common and Conquer games. And uh, ScumVM is also something I want to mention here. It's often referred to as an emulator, but it's actually a collection of game engine recreations. It was originally meant to run 
LucasArts point and click games uh, designed uh, with the SCUM engine in mind, but it supports a bunch of other point and click adventure games. And of course, it's available on every imaginable platform there is. Oh, and I also didn't mention uh, OPM MV, which is not, it doesn't stand for Mac Warrior, it's uh, Morrowind. Same thing with Morrowind. So <clears throat> these games uh, have their source, source codes released, usually by the publisher or the developer. But they are usually, <clears throat> or partially, uh, not entirely free. For example, Abuse was uh, released as uh, public domain, so you can do whatever you want with the code itself, but only the first shareware episode is included in the um, artist set. So you have to own a copy of uh, Abuse if you want to play with the other episodes. <clears throat> and something I want to talk about here is Free Allegiance, previously known as Allegiance, which was developed by Microsoft Research and Development. And uh, it was a game really ahead of its time. It's a mixture of, it's a hybrid of uh, um, FPS, space combat, and strategy, and since it had a really hardcore following, they decided to make it uh, open source, and they actually picked a, um, a license from the so-called share, shared uh, source Microsoft licenses, which is actually uh, approved as open source. So, ever since the community is hosting the project, they are hosting the servers and maintaining the code and patching it. Oh, another stuff here is All of One, which is uh, <laughs> a recreation, a source port of the first uh, three marathon games designed by Bungie, the game, the, the, the game designer company that uh, since then worked on such titles as Halo for Microsoft. But back then, they actually worked on Mac games, so that game was originally meant for, uh, designed for Macintosh, for, and uh, All of One can run on basically every system now. Marathon's actually the prequel story to Halo. And if you play Halo, if you have a flare grenade, there's still the Marathon logo on every flare grenade. Yeah. <laughs> oh, another game here is uh, the first Alien vs. Predator FPS because there are a bunch of games out there with this title, again. And uh, the, both the source code and uh, parts of the assets were shared, but they came with uh, custom license that doesn't allow you to make any commercial use or anything out of it. Basically, you are allowed to mod the game, and that's it, or make patches for it. And this last segment is about games with available source codes. They are usually leaked. For example, the Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3, the, the PlayStation version, its source code was found on floppy disks, so <laughs> nobody really knows how it got there. <laughs> And uh, another example is Turok the Dinosaur Hunter, the Nintendo 64 version. Uh, interestingly enough, they purchased the source code uh, of eBay with a development kit, which had the source code on it. <laughs> so it's out there somewhere. <coughs> and the Trespasser, which is another dinosaur-themed game, it got, our, it got the source code uh, leaked somehow, and the community actually still makes patches for it. And uh, I wanted to mention the Commander series here. That's another story. The source code wasn't really leaked. It was basically handed over by one of the original developers of the game since, as I mentioned, uh, abandonment previously, they are still copyrighted materials, but the, the publishers of the companies designing these games usually just don't care about it, don't support them anymore. So he just handed over the source code so the community still has fun with it, but they don't own the rights. Oh no, this is the last section. Reconst reconstructed source codes. <laughs> uh, examples are uh, Boulder Dash. It's a really <clears throat> well-known C64 uh, game. And uh, you can find the source code on GitHub. <laughs> and the same for Super Mario Bros. Uh, yeah, Nintendo is not really a fan of projects like this, but the GitHub, GitHub uh, source uh, code even has some uh, added comments to it. And I wanted to mention the last Ninja project because it has some Hungarian connections, and I highly recommend watching uh, the documentary called Mole Man 4, which is about the beginning of the Hungarian game development scene. 
And uh, another title here is the picture to the right called Power Slave, which was the PlayStation version of a uh, game other, uh, otherwise known as XQ. It had a PC port back then, but the two games were wildly different. So it had, they had shared some content and concepts, but uh, they used different engines. And uh, yeah, a guy actually tried to reverse engineer uh, the PlayStation version and made a source port out of it. This is uh, really heavily involved in retro FPS scene. And uh, since then, he did this. He was actually connect, uh, contacted by a company that makes uh, source ports, ports of all games as such. And they actually have the rights for this game. And now you can buy it legally off GOG. And it runs on a PC. And these are not games. These are software development kits. But I want to talk about them because, yet again, there is a common misconception that both the Half-Life wants gold source engine which is a heavily modified version of Quake 1. Uh, and the source engine is open source, but they're not. They, you actually have um, um, an SDK for them, but even the, the SDKs are not open source. The license is not open source. It's still proprietary. And the picture to the left, I probably can't read it. It's a segment from Half-Life 1's code, which says, if the language is German, you won't have jibs in the game, so no blood for you, because German censorship. And yeah, I wanted to mention some resources is used, uh, I used to prepare this talk. For example, the Free Software Foundation's website, which has a wiki of games. And uh, I also want to mention uh, Icolus here, who basically ported every game of my childhood to Linux. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, he talked about open source tools uh, for game development before. And uh, the here's the talk I mentioned before, making of Night in the Woods better with open source. It's about the tool they use for the, the branching narrative. And uh, I added another talk here I didn't really talk about much because I didn't really talk about emulators. But it's, it's a really interesting talk. It's a GDC talk you can watch on YouTube. It's about how the video game industry should embrace emulators instead of, instead of uh, still considering it as piracy, especially since Nintendo usually does stuff like uh, selling you uh, ROM they downloaded from the internet. And in the meantime, they're taking down friend projects like uh, Mario with a zero, which is a Portal Mario mashup, and they also went after <laughs> A No Man's Sky Mario hybrid on HIO, so their, their lawyers are not really happy with fan games. And yeah, I want to thank you. This was my talk about the role of open source in the video games industry and communities, and I used the following open source programs to prepare it. Mm -hmm. And if you have questions, ask away, or let's talk about it outside. Thank you. regarding uh, reconstructed games. Yeah. Uh, there's recently been an initiative for to reconstruct the uh, game called Roller Coaster Tycoon 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do it... Which was made mostly in assembly as far as I know. Uh, two was not. No, this is the first one. Mm -hmm. This is, I think it's was C++. But the first one was assembly. So they are reconstructing the code one by one by function by function, really. Yeah. And uh, would you say that this is another example of reconstructed source code, or because they use the actual binary of the game, is it another category? I, I would still list it here because these games are just the same. They usually had access to the ROM or the binary. And they, did, they didn't have access to the source code. So they didn't reinvent the original. They didn't have access to the source code somehow. And they didn't just make a, a replacement of that. They had to reverse engineer this usually. For example, the Power Slave was reverse engineered just as the project you were talking about. And yeah, I actually didn't talk about the legality of such stuff. I looked it up. Uh, the American law is actually way more permissive than the European, European law here because the US law says that you are allowed to reverse engineer software as 
as, as, as long as uh, there are some asterisks uh, attached, of course, but uh, you are usually free to do so, even if you, uh, you find trade secrets, but you had uh, purchased the, the copy you are uh, reverse engineering legitimately. But uh, the, um, of course, they are fixing this loophole by just uh, an user license agreement that specifically tells you you're not allowed to do that. And on the other hand, the European Union law specifically says that you are not allowed to do reverse engineering of software only in some cases, and uh, the cases uh, include stuff like when you have to make a when you have to work on another software that has to be compatible with the software you're reverse engineering, but I looked into the law, it doesn't really specify who has to own the software you're making, and it's, it's a bit fuzzy about the details here, so. Also, I've heard that in some cases you can uh, use the defense that you are doing it for accessibility, because there are many laws which are pretty strong about yeah. accessibility, especially in the US. Oh, also, it's, this is really important because uh, just as I said about Abandonware, that they are not um, supporting these old games anymore, some companies actually consider these games obsolete and they're, they just lose their source code and even actively destroy them. So we will lose parts of our history. We already did. For example, Atari just trashed the source code of, of, of a bunch of games that basically are parts of our culture and they don't exist anymore. So I think it's something we have to do ourselves to preserve these video games for the future. Yeah, it's quite similar to the way they taped over the original moon landing recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, allegedly taped. They featured the big original. Yeah, Dr. Rampisons. Other questions? Where can I download all this cool stuff and all the game files and everything? Oh yeah, I, I didn't mention those sources in, this, in, in, in my slide at the end, but I want to share these links with you guys. Probably it's going to probably be listed under the YouTube video or I can make a list and send it to you. Because uh, yeah, about, uh, yeah, I also want to mention the source of the pictures I use here because I didn't source them either. I usually went to the website of the project itself or looked it up on GOG or Steam and stuff like that. But uh, source code is just the same. It's usually on GitHub or some other accessible place. So you can do a search for it yourself. But of course, I'm going to link them. Other questions? Sure. I'm, I'm not, not really a gamer since probably about 20 years ago. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it, do you think it's... Um, well, I do have a connection with somebody who works in a school that uh, has a game department. It's quite progressive. So I'm interested in it from that point of view, that, you know, seeing uh, graduates from my friend's school become, we work on interesting projects. Um, is it, the question is, do you think it's healthy? I don't, I'm not, in terms of open source tools for development, I mean, it's quite okay that the AAA companies develop their own machines and do what they're going to do to make their game, right? Right. But it seems to me that you listed an awful lot of uh, open source tools yeah. for at the moment. Um, so the, is, it is, it, is it a healthy environment at the moment? Like, is there, there sufficient scope for people to develop? Um, I would say yes. Especially since a bunch of commercial titles, especially on mobile platforms, are based usually on such open source frameworks and engines. So even some platforms um, like mobiles and such, uh, even if they are commercial, are based on projects as such. And of course, the companies working on these games usually commit back to the project they base the games on. In any cases of abuse that are known of, like similar type of sort of uh, uh, free software license um, violations or going on in the, in the games industry? Well, I won't say, yeah, I haven't really looked into this. I'm pretty sure it happened before, but I don't have an example for it. Okay. Right, if there are no other questions, then that's it.